and the book is always in your mind and at the funniest times you'll be sitting there in the middle of conversation or as is happening to me you'll be driving and suddenly your subconscious informs you that it's worked out a wrinkle and it informs you and you go with it you get in this kind of reverie this extremely powerful sense of that reality taking over and it goes on and on and on until the cop pulls you over for going 95 miles an hour on the Baltimore Washington Parkway. This happened to me once. Um, you could be a danger to yourself. I, yeah, I am. Uh, but that's, you know, it really is, as I said, writing this book was fun. But for the most parts, most of the books have been fun. I can name a couple that were killers. Uh, I, I, in fact, one I literally wrote drunk because I was so sick of it and it took so long and there were so many missteps and failed, fallen, collapsed commercial initiatives in terms of getting it published that I could only face it after three beers and I could only sustain my writing period for three more beers before I was so insensible I couldn't drink. So the beer, Spanish right? Gambit written by Stephen Drunk Hunter. <laughs> yeah, I bet the story just couldn't get you. That probably was a lot of it. You didn't want yeah. to inhabit that. Do you think that um, all your, your years watching movies that the film critic thing has led you to think in, in visuals? Yes I, mean, I do. Uh, well I'm not, I'm not sure which is the cause and which is the effect. Okay. Maybe I was drawn to both because I had a visual imagination and because I see things in my, in my mind's eye uh, and, uh, and I have, seem to have some, uh, some sort of comprehension of cinematic cutting techniques that works right. very well in the in the books. I think so too, especially yeah. in this one. And I don't know where that comes from. Maybe it comes from the movies or maybe the movies merely endorse something that was already in some primitive form there. I've never really worked that out. Um, I, I know that many of the movies, many of the books are in funny ways rebukes to movies that I have seen and some aspects of them has displeased me. A perfect example is one of my most successful books is called The Day Before Midnight and it was a end of the world doomsday scenario against the clock kind of scenario a thing in which some Soviet special forces occupied an American missile silo and were trying to launch, launch a, a rocket and it was the American response and it cut back and forth between them and midnight was approaching when they would get the bird ready to launch after retargeting it or something like that and I realized about the third or fourth draft that it was Dr. Strangelove and I had it had all the beats the story was structured the same way it was the same range of characters uh, except that I told it from different points of view. I told it from the point of view uh, of the infantry, actually the airborne troops who were charged with taking Burpleson Air Force Base. But sort of the background story had this, it was all of, there was a code to be solved, there was an entry to be achieved, there was a mad general, there was a defense intellectual, there was a doomed uh, heroic officer and it, it, it was uh, in fact when I realized that it was almost plagiary, it was almost plagiarism, I was afraid that um, um, you know that the Kubrick estate would sue me. <laughs> they don't know who I am. Are you kidding? <laughs> what delusions of grandeur. That would have made the book. Uh, come on. So uh, but, but uh, you know something about his original version annoyed me and it was that they didn't really stress the heroicism of the attacking troops who were going against fortified gun positions and must have taken terrible casualties and I wanted to tell that story. See what I'd done, what happened is I had subsumed Dr. Strangelove, tried to figure out what was wrong with it in my, by my lights and then my, my uh, brain had, my subconscious had broken it apart rearranged the pieces but kept all the same pieces and reunited and suddenly 
it pops into my head and i honestly thought it was something entirely new and it wasn't it was just uh it was just a retread fortunately the 800,000 people who bought it didn't notice so you know i did okay i've often thought when i've read your books you know that there's a that fusion of of film yeah. and book, which is often, I might say, a very unhappy fusion, but that's usually when it's done by other people. Oh, well, thank you, you know, very much, but, but I've always thought yeah. that your books fed off yeah. the films. There's no doubt that it's true. I mean, it's not something that can really be helped. And maybe one reason I'm reluctant to leave the movie job is I need that input exactly. of imagery. Exactly. You know, at a certain level, everyone is a survival survivor and knows what they have to do to survive and maybe I need that. So. I've, I've often thought that because yeah. I mean obviously you could, yeah. you know, you could quit and, and I have run across writers who have given up their quote day job yeah. and and I think that the the loss of stimuli, the loss of energy and all that has come from that oftentimes shows up yeah. in their books. Yeah. You know, you often I often hear customers saying, you know, but I love I loved his early books. Yeah, and then yeah. there's that, you know, sort of yeah. implicit yeah. but what's yeah. he doing now yeah. kind of routine. Yeah. That's one reason I think maybe I'm so impressed by the forty seven samurai yeah. is you know, this is not this is a book, you know, you and your mature career, and yet it still has that kind of velocity. Thank you very uh, much. That yeah. you know might have yeah. might have been more apparent. Yeah, it was, uh, written by the eternal eight-year-old boy well, who happily sits in the. That's hard to sustain that. I mean, yeah. you know, the prison book I thought was a really hard book to read. Mm. Um, you know, that was a, I mean, that's such a deeply difficult environment yeah, anyway. Yeah, yeah. But I was reading today something that really impressed me because I was thinking about, you know, the fact that to a great degree you have focused upon that American icon, the Western, the loner. Mm -hmm. um, and a sniper really, if you think about it, is not is that indeed. different than a Western yep. hero. But you had you had some really interesting stuff I thought you said. You were talking about him and you said a sniper is a heart made by God and a discipline made by the Marine Corps, he stalked, you were writing about somebody, I think it was an obituary actually, he stalked and killed 93 of his country's enemies. And that was only the official count. It's not merely that Vietnam was a war largely without heroes, it's also that the very nature of Hathcock's heroism was a problem for so many. He killed nakedly and without warning. There is something in the mercilessness of the sniper that makes the heart recoil. He attracts vultures not only to his carcasses but also to his psyche. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, because in writing about this man, you were really writing, in essence, you know, kind of a biography. Of, well, that's very true. Of your um, hero, yeah. And he really yeah. is right from yeah. Western movies. That was, in fact, Carlos Hathcock, and the early Bob Lee Swagger was very much a Carlos Hathcock. Uh, f uh, a clone. I mean, I was f inspired by right. Charles Henderson's uh, book, Marine Sniper, which told the story of Carlos Hathcock. And, it's, and Car that's where I get the Arkansas from, because Carlos Hathcock was from Arkansas. I made my hero from Arkansas, mm -hmm. knowing nothing about Arkansas. But what attracted me to the sniper was that. I always, uh, the phrase I use and have used over and over, it's kind of a Faustian intellectual of war in the sense that he learned things he saw things he experienced things that no one else did he just had an incredible knowledge but it was not free of cost and part of the cost was that sense of estrangement from the people around him because he was the designated killer right. you know, it was his job explicitly to kill and one of my it connects with another idea that I have we pay people to kill for us and it it embarrasses us. You know, we don't want to be associated with it. So we love them when we need them, but otherwise they embarrass us and they never get the, you know, the pilots who drop the napalm, the the snipers, the Delta Force guys who cut sentries' throats. The, if you've read Marcus Luttrell's book, uh, Lone Survivor, you'll see what SEALs do, and it's a lot of killing. 